On today's story session, a tale that prominently features cannibalism and magical powers without ever explaining why either of them are happening. This is The Foundling. My name is Zach Stewart, and these are the Shadow Bear Story Sessions. Welcome to the Shadow Bear Story Sessions, the podcast about how brutally dark and totally insane folk tales and fairy tales used to be, which in my opinion just made them way better and more entertaining. So I've got the most true to the original version of Grimm's fairy tales that I could find, and we're going through it front to back, story by story. We'll figure out the difference between the intended lessons of each story and the literal lessons of each story, and at the end of each episode, I'll adapt the tale into a movie or TV show. Let's get right to it with today's tale titled, The Foundling. We begin. Once upon a time, a forester went out hunting in the forest. Makes sense. And as he entered it, he heard some cries that sounded like those of a small child. He followed the sounds and eventually came to a tall tree where he saw a little child sitting on the top. The child's mother had fallen asleep with him under the tree, and a hawk had seen the child in her lap, so it had swooped down, carried the child away with its beak, and set him down on top of the tree. The forester climbed the tree and brought the child down and thought, You ought to take him home with you and raise him with your little Lena. So he took the boy home. Wait, what happened to the child's mother, the one who fell asleep? Did she wake up, see the baby up in the tree, and just go, Well, I can't be bothered to climb all the way up there. Sorry, son. The bird is your mother now. Goodbye and good luck. (laughs) Maybe the boy wasn't making any noise when she woke up, so she just thought he'd either been kidnapped right from her lap, or maybe he'd crawled away. Seems more likely. And in that case, she probably ran around looking and couldn't find the boy. Which is so unbelievably tragic. Still, it's pretty fucked up of this forester guy to not even attempt to find this child's mother. Damn. All right, well. So he took the boy home, and the two children grew up together. However, the boy who had been found on top of the tree was called Foundling, because he had been carried off by a bird. Wouldn't he be called Foundling because they found him? It wouldn't be because of the bird detail. Weird. Anyway... Foundling and little Lena were very fond of each other. In fact, they loved each other so much that they became sad if they were not constantly within sight of each other. Well, I'll bet this little boy has some pretty deep abandonment issues after the whole thing with his mother, so I don't blame the kid for wanting to keep his loved ones within sight. Now, the forester had an old cook, and one evening she took two buckets and began fetching water. But she didn't go to the well simply one time, but many times. When little Lena saw this, she asked, "'Tell me, old Sana, why are you fetching so much water? "'If you promise to keep quiet, I'll let you in on my secret.' Little Lena, of course, replied that she wouldn't tell a soul. Then the cook said, "'Early tomorrow morning, when the forester goes out hunting, "'I'm going to heat some water over the fire, "'and when it's boiling, I'm going to throw foundling in and cook him.' Whoa, what the fuck, cook? That is insane. Why? Why are you doing that, cook? There's been no indication that anyone's starving or that they don't have enough food. This sounds like something the cook just wants to do. And the cook will definitely get caught for this, too. Forrester will get back to find that the boy is gone. There's a bunch of weird meat, and his daughter looks super traumatized. There's there's no possible way to get away with this. And come on, Lena, the daughter, has to tell her dad this. This isn't one of those situations where she can possibly justify not telling him by thinking, well, I did tell the cook I wouldn't tell anyone. No, no, that does not apply here. The cook's quote-unquote secret is that she's going to eat her brother, who she loves dearly. Tell your dad. We continue. Early the next morning, the forester got up to go out hunting, and after he had gone, the children were still in bed. So I guess she didn't tell anyone. 
Then little Lena said to Foundling, If you won't forsake me, I won't forsake you. Never ever, said Foundling. Well, then I'm going to tell you something important, said little Lena. Thank goodness. Last night, old Sana carried many buckets of water into the house, and I asked her why she was doing that. She said that if I wouldn't tell a soul, she'd let me in on her secret, and I promised her not to tell a living soul. Okay, she's really going beat by beat here. We don't need all of this background information. Just just get to the point. Time is of the essence at this point, Lena. The, the water's boiling. Then she said that early this morning, when my father goes out hunting, she would boil a kettle full of water, throw you in, and cook you. So let's get up quickly, dress ourselves, and run away together. So this little girl had two options. Option one, tell her father and get the cook fired and sent away. Option two, don't tell anyone and then run away with her brother and become homeless orphans. And she chose the homeless orphan option. It's not like the story can justify it with, well, she said she wouldn't tell anyone, because she told Foundling. So if you're going to tell people, just tell people. All or nothing here. It's literally life and death. Lena, come on. Hop into action. Let's go. Then the two children got up, dressed themselves quickly, and ran away. When the water in the kettle began to boil, the cook went into the bedroom to get Foundling and throw him into the kettle. But as she entered the room and went over to the beds, she saw that the two children were gone. And she became greatly alarmed. What shall I say when the forester comes home and sees that the children are gone, she said. I'd better send some people after them so we can get them back. The cook sent three servants to pursue them and bring them back. But the children were sitting at the edge of the forest and saw the three servants coming from afar. If you won't forsake me, I won't forsake you, said little Lena. Never ever, said Foundling. Then change yourself into a rose bush, and I'll be the rose on it, said little Lena. When the three servants reached the edge of the forest, they saw nothing but a rose bush with a little rose on it. The children were nowhere to be seen. Wait, these kids can fucking transform into stuff? They did not mention that before. Pretty major detail to leave out such an incredibly useful ability. They could have just transformed into something back at the house, though, and just waited for the dad to get back. That's a, this is a huge piece of information we are just now learning here. All right, so these kids have magical abilities. We continue. There's nothing we can do here, they said, and they went home, where they told the cook they had seen nothing but a rose bush with a rose on it. Then the cook scolded him. You blockheads! You should have cut the rose bush in two, plucked the rose, and brought it back with you. Now go quickly and do it. Okay, so the cook knows they can transform into stuff, and also knows how they would do it? With the daughter being the rose and foundling being the bush? What is happening? I feel like there's a lot of stuff being left out of the story that would help us follow this story and understand the stakes, and who knows what, and who could do fucking magic, and how that works. I'm so lost here. Also, I guess she wants them to cut foundling in half? She told them to cut the bush in half. So I guess, yeah, she she's abandoning this cannibalism angle and just wants to fucking kill this kid. Man, this cook hates Foundling. Why? What's her problem with Foundling? She's a poor orphan boy found in the woods. Man, kid can't catch a break. We continue. So they had set out once more and looked for the children. But when the children saw them coming from afar, little Lena said, If you won't forsake me... I won't forsake you. Never ever, said Foundling. It's actually quite sweet. Then change yourself into a church, and I'll be the chandelier hanging in it, little Lena said. When the three servants arrived at the spot, there was nothing but a church and a chandelier inside. What should we do here? Let's go home. When they got home, the cook asked whether they had found anything. They said no, they'd found nothing but a church with a chandelier inside. You fools, the cook scolded them. Why didn't you destroy the church and bring back the chandelier? This is bonkers. Why didn't they do that, cook? Because they're not fucking insane. That's why. How does the cook know exactly what's going on 
and what to do in every situation. Is the cook a, is the cook a witch? It'd be way cooler and make so much more sense if the cook was a witch and had been training the children in magic. That would explain so much. They could also then say that the witch wanted to eat Foundling to absorb his power or something, which would give some motivation as to why the hell she wants to eat this kid in the first place. If they made that change, it would tie together so many loose ends, so many threads, and explain so much. Instead, just nonsensical chaos. We continue. This time, the old cook herself set out on foot, accompanied by the three servants, and pursued the children. Good thinking. At least she's doing it herself this time. I don't know why she didn't do that to begin with. But the children saw the three servants coming from afar, and also the cook who was waddling behind them. So it paints a little bit of a picture on, on the cook here. Sort of her whole vibe. Foundling, said little Lena, if you won't forsake me, I won't forsake you. Never, ever, said Foundling. Then change yourself into a pond, said little Lena, and I'll be the duck swimming on it. When the cook arrived and saw the pond, she lay down beside it and began to drink it up. However, the duck quickly swam over, grabbed her head in its beak, and dragged her into the water. The old witch... Okay, witch. I guess she was a witch. They left that out until the very end. The old witch was thus drowned, and the children went home together. They were very happy, and if they haven't died, they're still alive. The end. <sighs> All right. Uh, All right, guys. I don't even... Sure, fine. What? Whatever. I will say I do actually like this story, but man, is it messy. So many questions and issues running running through my head right now. First thing, this isn't story related, just, just a thought. A duck can't drag a person underwater and hold them down. Ducks are very physically weak in this regard. So I don't think this, is, this would kill the cook. But the cook's strategy to kill foundling was to drink the pond. Did you really think that that would work? Did you really think that she was capable of drinking an entire pond? I guess if she's a witch, then she has magic powers, and they just don't mention that crucial fact to this very end. Or she's just insane, but also weirdly intuitive, and that's why she knew all of the all the stuff about what they would be, the rosebush and the and the church and all that. And if she is weirdly intuitive, then maybe she's right to kill Foundling. I mean, she intuitively knows every single move the kids make, so maybe she also intuitively knows that Foundling is destined to be an evil monster who kills thousands or causes a war or something. And I mean, if Foundling has these magic powers, then yeah, maybe he turns out to be evil and grows up to wreak havoc and misery and destruction. That'd actually be a pretty cool twist, to be honest. And again, it would give us some fucking justification for why the cook wants to kill and eat this kid in the first place, because... And I cannot reiterate this enough, there is no reason given for why the cook wants to eat this kid. But in fairness, the pond and duck transformation was pretty clever. Because it's, it's pretty hard to destroy a pond. The cook's best strategy is to drink it. But did she not notice the duck swimming up to her? Because she should have just, just grabbed the duck, and boom, she's got the daughter. Then do whatever you want with that pond. Leave it be. Just go back home. Fine. Problem solved. Then again, she really seems to want to kill Foundling. <laughs> she says they should have cut the rosebush in two, destroy the church, so apparently now she's not even intent on eating Foundling. She just wants to make sure he's dead. Again, we have no idea why, but that seems to be her goal here at this point. What happened after they drowned the cook and transformed back into children, though? Because those three servants... We're still right there watching all of this happen. They're probably terrified by this point. I mean, if you were one of the servants, this is a crazy day. First, the cook is like, the kids ran away. We got to find them. And then you can't find them. And the cook is like, ah, remember that rosebush and flower? You should have destroyed the bush and taken the flower. And you just be like, I don't know how that would have helped us find these kids. All right, whatever, we'll go back to the rose bush. Then you go back, and there's no rose bush, but the same thing happens with the church. And then you're like, I have no idea what's happening, cook. 
Clearly, you have some better sense of what the hell is going on right now, so why don't you come with us this time? So she does, and this time she stops at a pond and starts drinking that pond. I'm sure all of the servants at this point looked between each other like, what the hell is this crazy bitch doing? Then a duck swims up, grabs the cook with its beak, drags her underwater, and drowns her. And then the pond and duck magically evaporate and turn into the two missing kids. You would be super freaked out. You'd just be like, yeah, all right, let, let's just go home. Guys, also, we need a raise because this job is way different and more stressful than I was expecting. I thought I was just going to have to chop firewood and take care of some goats. How do they explain all this to the dad when he got back? Because now the cook has vanished under very questionable circumstances. Dad's going to have some questions. And you think it would be helpful that the servants saw everything? But then again, they don't know that the cook was going to eat foundling. So as far as they know, the kids ran away and the cook was just trying to get them back. And then when she tried to bring them back, the kids straight up murdered the cook. So from the servant's perspective... The kids were running away, and the cook was just trying to bring them back. So she's just doing her job. I don't know how you handle this from their perspective, but I guess you probably just keep your mouth shut, because you're definitely going to be terrified of these kids and not want to upset them for the rest of the time you work there. Man, I also can't help coming back to the fact that the daughter should have just told the dad. So that so the dad just fired the cook. Boom. Problem solved. No more cook. Cook, you're fired. Bye. Now she can't eat this poor kid, whose life is probably hard enough after having been orphaned in the woods. Now this lady wants to eat him. Good thing he's got magic powers that are entirely unexplained, though. So at least he's got that going for him, I guess. <laughs> I love when they do this with the ending, too. This happens in a number of these stories where they have a last line like this. And if they haven't died, they're still alive. It's like, all right, I guess by definition, yeah. Don't really think you need to say that. You could just end on, and they were very happy. Then again, adding that little bit implies that they might still be out there somewhere. It adds a little bit of realism. Like, you could go find them in the forest. Like, people like this are actually out there in the world, and you can meet them and talk to them. So, you know what? I take it back. No criticism of that line. I changed my own mind on it. I mean, they could phrase it better, I guess. Something like, and, and legend has it, they still live in the forest to this day. Or, and as far as anyone knows, they still live happily in the forest to this day. You could make it sound a little more eloquent, I guess, than literally, if they haven't died, they're still alive. Still, I like the sentiment it's trying to impart. Finding lessons in this story is it's a little difficult because there's no... There's, there's so little motivation for what the characters do and what ultimately happens. I think the biggest intended lesson is just to stick by those that you love. The line that's repeated is the one where Elena says, if, if you won't forsake me, I won't forsake you. And that's actually pretty powerful, coming from the adoptive sister of this little boy who was found in a tree in the forest. So that's actually a very sweet and lovely message, that if you stand by the people you love, you can work together and find creative solutions to your problems. Stick together... Trust each other. I think that's a beautiful lesson. And I don't know if this is intended lesson or not, but another lesson to take is, is that you, you can find your family. You don't have to be born into your family. And then the love that holds you together can be just as strong or even stronger than if you were born into, into that family. And I'd say that works for a community level as well. And in, in this story, Foundling is adopted by this family, and Foundling and Lena love each other so much that Lena literally decides to abandon her father and her home to save Foundling's life. Again, I, I think there were other solutions to this particular problem, but that decision of hers to stand by her brother is incredibly powerful and beautiful. That because of her love for her adopted brother, she's willing to give up her home and her father. She's like, I love you, brother. I'll never abandon you or give up on you. We'll figure it out together. Let's go. That is so fucking beautiful. I love it. So that's another lesson. Adoption is a beautiful thing. And we can broaden that beyond literal adoption too. Take it out to the friendship and community level. You don't have to be born into a particular family or community or, or group to, to then find your own family, your sense of belonging, your own friends, your own community. You can find your own community and then build these beautiful, enduring, and, and powerful, loving relationships. I love that. 
Now for, for some literal lessons. I like the serious lessons, but I also like, like the silly lessons. So literal lesson number one, if someone says they're going to do some fucked up shit like eat a kid or murder somebody or something, tell someone. You do not have to keep that secret. In fact, if you're doing more harm by keeping that secret than by telling someone, which is definitely the case in this story, then definitely tell someone. I mean, in this story, if she told her dad, then the only consequence would have been that the cook would have been fired. It's a pretty low-stakes outcome, when the other outcome is that a child gets killed and eaten. Another lesson? Keep an eye on the people around you. I doubt that this cook's decision to eat a kid just came out of nowhere, you know? There had to have been some signs prior to this that there was, there was something a little off about this cook. If the dad had been keeping tabs on his employees and talking with them regularly... Maybe you would have noticed some trouble brewing before it, before it came to cannibalism. And the final lesson, question the orders that are given to you. This one is about the servants. Cook is telling them to find the kids, but then when they don't, the cook starts telling them to cut a rosebush in half, and then she tells them to she tells them to destroy a church. That is a major red flag right there. If anyone is telling you to destroy a church, or any building at all really, there's something fucked up going on. And the person who's giving you that order is probably not on the right side of whatever's happening. If I were one of these servants, I'd be like, yeah, I'm not really comfortable destroying a church and stealing the chandelier inside. I thought we were trying to find the forester's kids. Why are you giving us orders to, to destroy stuff? Definitely not going to do that. I don't even work for you. I work for the forester. We all do. We're co-workers here. Why are you giving us orders to destroy stuff out in the forest under the guise of trying to find missing children? So yeah, there's the last lesson. It's okay to question the orders that you're being given, especially if those orders are irrational, unjustified, and or destructive. All right, let's adapt this thing. So with this one, I'm, I'm not going to change the rough outline as much as I usually do because I actually really like the framework here, but I think the details can be worked with. So this will still take place in medieval times. The protagonist is going to be a young-ish girl in her 20s who will be played by Amanda Stenberg. And she attends this funky, weird witchcraft school in the middle of the forest. And the school is run by an old witch who will be played by Judy Dench. Judy Dench, the mystical, magical witch of the woods. And one day, while Judy Dench is conducting a class out in the forest... a Amanda stumbles across a girl lost in the woods. And this girl will be played by someone like... Kamiko Glenn from Orange is the New Black. And while at first the witchmaster Judy Dench is reticent and wary, she is convinced by Amanda to bring Kamiko back to the school just for a night so they can give her a good meal, and the next day they'll send her in the, in the direction of the town. But then that night, while, while they're eating dinner, some other student makes an insulting comment to Kamiko, like, why'd they bring back a dumb little lost rabbit from the woods? And Kamiko yells something back like, well, all the monsters in the woods look like angels compared to you with your busted-ass face. When she yells this, the flames and all the candles in the hall, they burn super bright, and then they all go out. So everyone's like, oh, oh shit, she's got some kind of natural magical ability here. And Judy Dench decides she should stay and learn the ways of magic. And Amanda and Kamiko quickly become best friends as they train together. And then one day, a while later, one of the teachers, who will be played by, let's say, Benedict Cumberbatch, has a vision in which he sees Kamiko being a horribly destructive force. And he tries to convince Judy Dench to throw her out. He's like, she'll kill us all, Judy. I've got to kill this forest girl first. But, you know, he says it all in tense and cumberbatchy. But Judy refuses and believes that, that they can teach her and says that she's done nothing wrong and so they won't punish her until she does because Judy Dench is a just and kind witch master. And so Benedict decides that if they won't throw her out, then he'll have to kill her himself. And one day, Amanda overhears a contentious conversation between Judy and Benedict. She keeps an eye on Benedict and realizes he's, he's trying to kill Kamiko. Like one day, a giant brick falls out of the side of a tower and nearly crushes Kamiko, and Amanda turns and sees Benedict Cumberbatch peering around a corner like, and, and Amanda and Kamiko are walking down a path, and an arrow just flies right by Kamiko's head. And Amanda turns to see Benedict Cumberbatch, and, and he quickly like throws a bow behind a hay bale and looks away nonchalantly and starts whistling. Anyway, it's clear that he's trying to kill Kamiko, but he's a teacher, so they can't really do anything. And all the while, 
It is clear that the Kamiko has a very troubled past and does have some darkness in her. But, but she is ultimately kind and well-meaning, and she and Amanda grow close until they're basically sisters. So one day, Amanda says, Look, Benedict Cumberbatch is going to keep trying to kill you. He is insane. We need to leave. And Kamiko's like, you've, you've trained your whole life here. This is what you want. I won't let you just leave it all behind for me. And Amanda says, I know, but you're my sister and I love you. We'll figure it out. I'd rather be anywhere with you than here without you. And so they decide to leave together early in the morning. And the school realizes they've gone, and Benedict Cumberbatch is like, Shit, now my vision will come true. They'll venture across the countryside, wreaking havoc and destruction. And so Benedict Cumberbatch goes after them. And Amanda and Kamiko manage to evade him for, for quite a while, using various disguises and transforming into different things. But he keeps getting closer and finally uncovers their disguise when they're transformed into a, into a pair of candles in a church. He finds them, and they turn back into humans, and there's a big magic battle in this church. And finally, Amanda and Kamiko get the best of him, and Benedict is at their mercy and is like, I know there's darkness in you, Kamiko. I know you want to kill, so go ahead and kill me and prove me right. And then bang! Amanda smashes him in the back of the head with a giant candlestick and beats his head into a pulp. And she drops the candlestick, and Kamiko's like, why do you do that for me? And Amanda's like, we've all got darkness in us, sister. And it was time I let mine out on him. I got you, sis. Also, fuck him. The only reason we wanted to kill him was because he wanted to kill you. I hate when people do that and twist shit around like, ooh, I know you, just prove me right. And they return to Judy Dench's magic school and are welcomed back. And the sisterhood and love between Amanda and Kamiko allows Kamiko to harness her darkness and use it for good. And become a powerful and benevolent soul. A benevolent sorceress. And together... A man and Kamiko live happily ever after. The end. And that will do it for this week's story session. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Come on back next week for a story titled King Thrushbeard. That is a hell of a title right there. In fact, I would happily take King Thrushbeard as a nickname. That is epic. So come on back next week for that. My name is Zach Stewart, and these are the Shadow Bear Story Sessions.